After a Russian fighter pilot crashed into the back of an American drone, we decided to dive into just how poorly trained these aviators are. And what we found surprised us. Last week, we discussed how Russia's weakened economy results in fighter pilots with roughly half the cockpit experience of their Western counterparts. But this week, we're taking those pilots to combat to talk about how this lack of training has far-reaching effects not only on the battlefields of Ukraine, but for Russia's future as well. Let's talk about what happens when pilots have to fight before they're trained for it. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. So, if you felt that last week's episode, with its emphasis on budgets and training requirements, was boring, I apologize. I'm recording these episodes back to back, so I haven't had a chance to read the comments on that video yet, but I can understand how it would seem dry. As Dan Carlin once put it, I am addicted to context, and whenever I'm presenting a strong argument, especially one that's sure to ruffle some people's feathers, I like to provide as much context as I can, not just to substantiate my position, but to equip you to form your own in case yours doesn't jive with mine. Defense analysis is a dirty and nuanced job because everything is connected. Everything is context. And when we focus too closely on any one topic without zooming out to see how other things connect to it, we run the real risk of missing the forest for the trees. So while I recommend that you watch that whole video to be well informed, I'll give you a very brief synopsis now. In part one, we talked about how Russian defense spending has floated at around $65 billion over the past nine years or so, with just $6.7 billion of that allocated to its air forces. And even when we adjusted for purchasing power parity with the United States to give Russia as fair a shake as we could, that still only equates to about $21 billion a year allocated towards its air forces which obviously compares pretty unfavorably to the 190 plus billion per year the U.S. gives its Air Force alone. But that is perfectly in keeping with what we know about Russian military doctrine and how they see aircraft not really as a power unto themselves, but really as a form of extended artillery. From there, we talked about how this lack of funding results in Russian aviators reaching their first combat units with about half the cockpit time of their Western counterparts. And even when we use data about Russian training flight hours per month that's so optimistic it's pretty unrealistic, this experience gap between Russian and American aviators either persists or gets significantly worse the longer your career goes on. We also talked about how the U.S. and its allies have invested heavily into large-scale combined arms training exercises to give pilots very realistic combat situations to train in. And while Russia does conduct large-scale training exercises at times, these exercises are far less frequent and far smaller in scope, at least when speaking specifically about how aircraft coordinate with one another and other forces in the region. And when we left off, I was arguing that this lack of experience, combined with a lack of realistic large-scale training exercises, is causing real problems for Russia's invasion efforts in Ukraine. This week, I'm going to put up or shut up about those claims and offer you my best evidence to substantiate them. But further, I'll also explain why it'll take years and maybe even decades for Russia's pilot corps to recover from this conflict, regardless of the outcome. And just to send my point home, I'm also going to directly compare Russia's air campaign over Ukraine to the Gulf War air campaign of 1991. Because despite Russia having the benefit of over three decades since then, the coalition forces back in 91 seem to have a much better grip on how to conduct air combat operations. Okay, enough of this previously on air power. Let's dive into this week's topic. Russian forces invaded Ukraine just over a year ago now, and despite the nation's massive technological and numerical advantage in the skies, Ukraine's airspace remains broadly contested. In fact, according to American defense officials, Ukraine, armed with a much smaller and less modernized air force and even more dated air defense systems, has been more successful in downing enemy aircraft than Russia has to date. Though, to be fair, Ukraine does have a lot more targets to aim at. But this is really where the lack of training for Russian pilots and ground crews becomes most evident. Because throughout this conflict, Russia has struggled to deconflict Ukrainian airspace, which is a fancy military way of saying that they've got a bad habit of shooting their own airplanes down. I'm going to quote now Professor Justin Bronk, who was recently awarded his PhD and who's a defense analyst for the Royal United Services Institute, or RUSI. 
Running joint engagement zones in which combat aircraft and SAM systems can engage enemy forces simultaneously in a complex environment without friendly fire incidents is hard. It requires close inter-service cooperation, excellent communications, and regular training to master. So far, Russian forces have shown extremely poor coordination across the board. From basic logistics tasks to coordination of airborne assaults with ground forces activity and arranging air defense over columns on the move. Now, to be clear up front, it's tough to be certain about friendly fire incidents among Russian forces in Ukraine for a variety of reasons, including both the fog of war and the Kremlin understandably refusing to publicly acknowledge them. But both independent Western analysis and statements coming directly from the field paint a grim picture. At least one Russian-backed commander whose name I'll now butcher, Alexander Khodakovsky, famously claimed that as much as 60% of Russian combat losses that happened between May and November of last year all came as a result of friendly fire. Now, that could just be an exaggeration. It's not crazy to me that a Russian commander might see that as a more logical explanation for the heavy losses they've been suffering. After all, attributing those losses to Ukraine would suggest that they're a pretty capable fighting force. But exaggeration or not, things aren't much better in the sky. In just the initial days of fighting, numerous reports of Russian aircraft being downed by their own air defenses permeated the web. And while hard numbers may never emerge, U.S. defense officials have substantiated a number of these stories as they surfaced. It was also discussed in a 69-page Rusi analysis of the conflict that they published in July, called Preliminary Lessons in Conventional Warfighting from Russia's Invasion of Ukraine, February through July 2022. I'll quote that report now. Fratricide has been a widespread problem for the Russian forces during their invasion of Ukraine. This has been across all systems. Russian air defenses have regularly engaged friendly aircraft. Arguably the highest profile of these incidents came in July of 2022, when video first surfaced of Russian air defense systems shooting down what they thought at the time to be a Ukrainian aircraft. It wasn't until later that they found out that it was actually one of 10 or fewer advanced new Su-34Ms in existence. This modernized fourth-generation fighter bomber could be compared in a lot of ways to America's F-15E Strike Eagle, and it's among the most capable and expensive jets in the Russian arsenal. This $50 million aircraft was shot down over Ukraine by Russian air defenses literally just days after it was delivered. It probably still had that new airplane smell. And not to pat myself on the back, but Rusi's analysis agrees with me that these fratricidal failings can be directly attributed to a lack of realistic training before this war started. I'll quote them here. This speaks to a lack of C2 and control measure during operations. It likely reflects Russian troops largely conducting scripted exercises rather than free play force-on-force -force activity, where they're used to dealing with the ambiguities that arise on the battlefield. Now, it's important to know that no nation with a sizable air force is immune to fratricide or friendly fire incidents, and the U.S. is no exception. In 2003, for instance, American Patriot air defense systems were responsible for downing two friendly aircraft, one American and one British. Back in 1987, a U.S. Navy F-14 Tomcat shot down a U.S. Air Force RF-4C reconnaissance jet over the Mediterranean Sea. Now, these are not completely isolated incidents, but they are exceedingly rare. And that rarity of fratricide incidents between American and allied forces can really be directly attributed to continuous investment into new technologies aimed at quickly deconflicting complex battle spaces, but certainly also to large-scale combined arms training like Red Flag. So to establish a basis of comparison, let's talk about the Coalition Forces Gulf War Air Campaign, which, despite being more than three decades old now, really offered a clinic in deconflicting far more combat aircraft in a much smaller space than Ukraine. Back in 1991, some 2,780 Coalition fixed-wing aircraft flew over 116,000 combat sorties in Iraq over the span of just 37 days. This breaks down to about 3,135 sorties per day throughout the air campaign. And of course, there were also a reported 1,114 fixed-wing Iraqi aircraft flying in the same airspace, and countless air defense systems from all nations also in play. 
Between coalition and Iraqi forces combined, there were more than 4,000 fixed-wing aircraft, along with many more rotorcraft operating within less than 170,000 square miles. But despite this density of platforms within a confined space, the coalition lost just 52 fixed-wing aircraft, with one air-to-air -air loss to an enemy fighter and the remainder coming from Iraqi ground-based anti-aircraft fire. While the Gulf War did see friendly fire incidents that involved aircraft firing on ground troops, not a single aircraft was lost to fratricide. Though to be completely fair here, one U.S. Navy A-6E pilot did report being fired upon by a friendly surface-to-air missile that missed. Now, let's compare that to Russia's air campaign over Ukraine, in which far fewer aircraft are operating over an even larger area, a bit more than 233,000 square miles. Now, it's tough to say exactly how many combat aircraft Russia has committed to this fight, particularly because many don't actually cross the border into Ukraine, opting for the safety of launching long-range cruise missiles into the embattled nation from Russian airspace instead. But according to Russian state-controlled media, the nation flew some 34,000 combat sorties between the onset of the war on February 24th and mid-October of 2022, breaking down to around 150 combat sorties per day. And while Iraqi forces were operating more than a thousand fixed-wing aircraft back in 91, Ukraine's Air Force started this war with just 125 fixed-wing assets. Put simply, the Gulf War air campaign creates a damning juxtaposition when compared directly to Russia's air campaign over Ukraine. Russian aircraft are flying about 5% as many sorties in an area that's 37% larger, against a force just 11% the size of Iraq's. But while the coalition lost a total of just 52 fixed-wing aircraft in combat and none to friendly fire, Russia has already lost a confirmed 352 fixed-wing aircraft. But even crazier than that to me is that even Russian propaganda websites have begun highlighting how many of these losses came as a result of friendly fire. I'm going to quote the pro-Kremlin analysis outlet slash propaganda mouthpiece Rybar. Insufficient levels of interaction with other branches and types of troops, along with an inoperative identification system, has more than once led to friendly fire to a point that almost all Su-34, Su-35S, and Su-30M aircraft lost since spring, as well as part of the Ka-52 helicopters, are all on account of Russian air defense. I mean, when even the outlets who make their money by saying good things about the Russian military start reporting on friendly fire being a systemic issue, it really makes you raise an eyebrow. And while many Russian aircraft are still flying with dated systems that aren't too dissimilar from those employed back in 91, even those carrying more advanced systems on board have demonstrated an inability to effectively leverage them, either due to inexperience or issues with their design. As just one example, one of the more common electronic warfare pods carried by Russian aircraft automatically detects radar and disrupts them. But it can't discern between enemy and friendly radar, so if you do leave it on, on, it will disrupt the radar function of other aircraft flying alongside you, so most fighters have had to just leave them turned off. Now, of course, there are always technical setbacks when you incorporate new systems into active service, but this is the sort of problem that would have been a glaring issue in a large-scale combat exercise, and one would hope the sort of problem you'd address before sending these systems into the fight. But addressing Russia's troubled relationship with advanced military technology will have to be a subject for another video. Now, to this point, we've already discussed at length the differences between Russian and American pilot training, but one of the issues we didn't touch upon in part one was the volume of trainees that pass through these schools. The number of pilots that Russia is able to push through training has already been negatively affected for years by a lack of modern and serviceable training aircraft, but that's really just one of a number of bottlenecks in Russia's pilot training pipeline. According to that Rusi analysis, Russia may have entered the Ukrainian war with as few as just 100 fully trained combat fighter pilots, forcing the rest of its aviators into the fight without even completing the full breadth of instruction required by their own standards. But the truth is, that's not the full extent of their pilot crisis, that's the beginning of it. Russia's military culture dictates that the most dangerous missions be assigned to the most skilled and competent aviators, and at first pass, that philosophy makes plenty of sense. 
But the problem with it is that it leads to higher attrition or losses among the most qualified pilots in your force. And once Russia realized that they were quickly running out of their most highly competent pilots, they reportedly began mobilizing the pilot instructors and trainers right out of their flight schools like Krasnodar, putting these highly skilled pilots directly into frontline formations where, again, they do suffer the highest level of attrition. Now, this has obviously resulted in a shortage of trainers, creating further bottlenecks in today's pilot training pipeline and further reducing the number of new aviators that can enter service and make their way to the fight. But importantly, the loss of many of these instructors and trainers will continue to be a problem for years to come as Russia needs to develop and train new instructors and trainers to fill those gaps in their training apparatus. But it still gets worse because the shortage of experienced pilots in Russia's Air Force has resulted in an influx of inexperienced new pilots who are flying alongside older retirees who've been brought back into service after literally years away from the cockpit. And that has forced a shift in how Russia goes about carrying out its air combat operations. I'll quote Rusi again. The Ukrainian military has noted a rise in both very young and very old pilots in the Russian Air Force, with aging pilots returned to frontline service. This has corresponded with a significant reduction in the scale and complexity of Russian air operations over Ukraine since the beginning of this conflict. This experiential deficit has manifested in a number of other areas of Russia's air campaign as well. As early as March 9th of 2022, Russian air forces attempted to transition to low-altitude night operations as they were just losing way too many aircraft to Ukrainian defenses during the day. But because only Russia's Su-34s are properly equipped for these flights, and there are so few pilots capable of conducting them, these night operations quickly degraded into simple bombardments of besieged cities, like Kharkiv and Mariupol, using what effectively amounts to the same tactics leveraged by Russian aviators in the uncontested airspaces of Syria. But unsurprisingly, this approach proved ineffective, so despite the relative safety offered by night flying, Russia had to pivot back away from nighttime operations after just a month or so of effort. But the truth is, Russian aviators are facing more challenges than just their own lack of training. Their aircraft are also being maintained and serviced by inexperienced ground crews, worsening the technical limitations they're facing and further reducing survivability in contested environments. This time, I'll quote a different piece of analysis penned by Justin Bronk, Nick Reynolds, and Jack Waitling called The Russian Air War and Ukrainian Requirements for Air Defense. In this part of the report, they're talking about their findings from recovered, crashed Russian aircraft in Ukraine, particularly rotorcraft like the Ka-52, but these issues extend all the way into fixed-wing assets. Modern encrypted radio sets have been found without the encryption keys needed to use them, and in others, the radar and other sensors have been found either in the stowed position or with pins or covers still fitted that prevent them from working. When you consider the full scope of serious and far-reaching issues facing Russian combat pilots, the lack of Russian air power throughout much of this conflict suddenly makes a whole lot more sense. In fact, in my lowly opinion, in the face of all of these challenges, it's pretty impressive that Russian aircraft losses haven't been even worse. Ukraine's defenses may be technologically and numerically inferior to Russia's, but they're certainly no slouches, and many of these Russian aviators are still getting the job done, despite their own nation stacking the deck against them. Now, there are lots of conclusions we can draw about the effective use of air power in a 21st century conflict, or the importance of a training infrastructure that mirrors the complexity of modern warfare, but the most glaring conclusion may be the one that's also the most well-tread since this invasion began. It is clear that Russia did not expect this to become a protracted fight, and as a result, they are utterly unprepared for one. But I want to close on a reminder, because as damning as this analysis of Russian air power may be, it's really important that we not lose sight of Russia's continued combat capacity. All of these shortcomings that we've run through over the past two episodes have certainly helped Ukraine fend off their larger and much more powerful opponent for better than a year now. But this fight is not over, and lives are being lost as we speak. It seems evident that Russia's strategic, doctrinal, and cultural failings have created a window of opportunity for an absolutely heroic Ukrainian defense, 
but these shortcomings aren't enough to ensure Russia's defeat, and Ukraine still has one hell of a fight ahead of it. And on that sobering reminder ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. I want to thank Hector Tinoco for handling editing duties on this episode. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.